Six second order equations and four y of t graphs are given below. The equations are all of this form. So the second order differential equations all have this, this form. So this is the natural forces and this is the external forcing function. Now this thing is uh, the y of t graphs are given below for various values of the parameter p, q, and omega. For each y of t graph, determine the second order equation for which y of t is a solution. So these are all going to represent solutions of a particular differential equation, second order. And state briefly how you know your choice is correct. You should do this exercise without using technology. And that's always what the uh, challenge is for students. We're so used to the technology, we should know enough. However, I found that there isn't a magic trick to this. And it's there's ways that you can eliminate things and ways that you can look at stuff. But it is a little bit of work that goes into it. So here we go. Now, when you look at each of these graphs, this first part of the graph here has to do with the natural frequency, or y sub h. And this bit here has to do with the external force. In other words, that external forcing function here is what everything tends to. That's what it's supposed to do. So you got some natural stuff going on, and then the external force happens, and it starts moving it towards that external force, and like a pumping motion or a spring mass motion, something that effect. So again, each one of these, I have to think about y sub h, and then this has got to be to do with uh, cosine omega t in all cases. So what I did first is I took a look at the period of these each of the external forces, and then that could tell me right away what omega is and maybe eliminate a few things. So here I notice that I have one, two, three waves between 6 and pi and 8 pi, so that my, means my period is 2 pi divided into 3 pieces, which means that omega is 2 pi divided by the period, 2 pi divided by 3. That's something from trigonometry. The period for this guy is defined as 2 pi over omega. So if I want to find omega, I can have the period and then solve for omega. So in this case, omega turns out to be 3. So if omega turns out to be 3, that just narrows down the possibilities for this one to be part 5 or part 6. So I'm going to write down here, this is either 5 or 6, and then I'm going to use other methods to determine which one that is. Here my period, uh, I have 1 wave over 2 pi. That means that omega is equal to 2 pi divided by 2 pi, which is 1. So that narrows down my choices to 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Going to the next paragraphs, I have a period here of 1. I'm sorry, a period here of 2 pi. And that means, just like in part b, that omega is equal to 1. Narrows down my choices to 1 and 2. And then lastly, uh, again, if I look, I have 1, 2, 3, so my period is 2 pi divided up into 3. My omega turns out to be 3, like in part A, so that means that my choices here are narrowed down to 5 and 6. Okay, so I've already narrowed down my choices. It looks like that if I had an omega of 2, that's not going to work, so those are out of the picture altogether. So we've narrowed it down to two choices for each. Now the next part is we have to look at the y sub h part in each. Do a little bit of calculation to see how it's behaving initially because these are all initially behaving differently. These two have very little oscillation going on at the beginning. But these two have much more oscillation happening at the beginning. Okay, so that's, that's a key to what's happening here. So I'm going to go over to my other piece of paper here. And I'm going to start thinking about, okay, if I were to go ahead and solve for y sub h in each of these cases, how would I do that? So for part one, I would solve for y sub h by creating the s-based quadratic or characteristics of the polynomial. That would be s squared plus 5s plus 3 equals 0. And I would solve that. For two, I would solve s squared plus s plus 3 equals 0. 
Remember Q is 3 and P is 1 and then we create our characteristic polynomial from that. And so if I scroll down a little bit for 5, so 5 my equation is s squared plus 5s plus 1 equals 0. And then for 6 I have s squared plus s plus 1 equals 0. Now I'm actually going to go through the process of uh, finding y sub h without a whole lot, you know, without a whole lot of hullabaloo and as quickly as possible. So using these all require the quadratic formula. None of them are factorable. None of them are factorable. So don't even try it. Now if I calculate s here, I get minus 5 plus or minus the square root of 13 over 2. And if I estimate uh, s1 turns out to be negative 0 0.6972 approximately and s2 is approximately negative 4.3078. So my y sub h of t looks in general to be k1 e to the s1t plus k2 e to the s2t. Now the combination of those two things when you graph it just turns out to be an exponential function. So initially for whatever value of k1 and k2 it's just going to come down pretty sharply. Okay, pretty sharply. And then the external forcing function is going to happen and, 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 and affect the rest of the behavior here. Now here I come up with s is equal to minus 1 plus or minus i squared of 11 over 2 and then my y sub h of t turns out to be k1, whoops, equal k1 e to the minus 1 half t cosine of square root of 11 t plus k2 e to the minus 1 half t sine square root of 11 t. Now because we have this additional trig functions in here, it's not purely exponential like this guy here. Initially for our forcing function or for our differential equation, the solution is going to have some oscillation happening before it settles down into the forcing function pattern. Part 5, I have s is equal to minus 5 plus or minus square root of 21 over 2. And this seems very similar to case 1 there. So s1 is approximately equal to minus 0.2087. S2 is approximately equal to minus 4.7913. And again, y sub h behaves the same as in 1. K1 e to the S1t plus K2 e to the S2t. And again, it's going to have a very same natural frequency kind of behavior where it's just going to come down and slow down really fast and start getting into the pattern of the forcing function early. This guy here is s equals minus 1 plus i squared of 3 over 2. My y sub h of t equals k1 e to the minus 1 half t cosine of square root of 3t plus k2 e to the minus 1 half t sine square root of 3t. And again, you know, I'm not showing you all the work, by the way, to get to y sub h. You can verify that yourself. Okay, you can verify that I did my s right using quadratic formula. You can verify that that's a solution. It is. So this is a lot like part two here where you have the natural frequency behaving very loosely until it's going to fall down into the forcing function. And why? Because we have these guys here. Now, if you remember vocabulary, these two guys here, we say it's underdamped. Just by nature of the um, eigenvalues. This one here is overdamped. So what does that mean? That means that an overdamped function, an overdamped solution, or differential equation, or however you want to say it, will quickly fall into forcing function behavior where this guy over here will do some oscillations away from it before it settles down into the forcing function. That's why it means underdamped. In other words, it's not damping as quickly as this guy. So what does that mean for our pictures here? 
you get the right piece of paper here. So when I look at these, I'm going to compare these two right here. I don't think I can get it any wider. I'm going to compare A and D because they both have the same choices here. Now when I look at the, the natural portion of the graph, this one looks like it's not doing a lot of oscillating. It's doing a tiny bit of oscillating because if you think about it, when you solve this guy, there's going to be this y sub h plus y sub p, right? y sub h plus y sub p. And in our problem, we know y sub p is going to have some uh, trig functions in it. So that's what's causing the waviness. But the general movement here is exponential in nature. Okay. So between 5 and 6, if I look between 5 and 6, the one that has behavior that's more exponential is number 5. Number 5. So I'm guessing that it's number 5, but let's just take a look at D. Now you notice that D, it's settled, but you can see that you have some oscillating happening and before it settles down into this. Now notice how it drops and then oscillates, and this one is just oscillating as it goes. So this one has much more initial movement here for the Y sub H part, part has much more oscillation going on. So I'm going to say that's 6. And in the end, I'm going to say that this is 5. Just because of the way it ha behaves initially. Now, if I look at B and C in the similar way, I can see in part B, I got lots of oscillations happening initially. And part C, I have just a very fast drop before it falls into place. So if I look back over here, this is between 1 and 2, I see 1 is the fast moving over damped and 2 is the slower moving under damped. So that means that this guy is going to be the over damped version and this guy will be the under damped version. So I know probably students didn't expect to have to go through and do through all of this baloney, but again, you know, you can use a little bit of technology to do these values here, but you should know how these graphs are going to be behaving just because your knowledge of college algebra more than anything else. All right, so I hope that helps.